into nailing it down, a product of Varmblog. Um, I always feel weird saying product of Varmblog, but I don't really know what else to call it. Um, and you might notice that there is another person with us here today. This person will be a semi-regular. Hello. This is thanks for having me. An intelligent layperson, so that I don't just spend all the time talking to myself. I'm the dunce in the room so. to ask a couple of questions here and there. Yeah, you're not a dunce. Um, but today, talking about a 1947 essay um, by Harold Draper, our, he was called before he was 18. Excuse me, Hal Draper, our Harold Dumaninsky. Um, I'm sure we're and, related. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> I mean, he, he was of Jewish extraction from from what is now Ukraine. Um, exactly. Then part of the Russian Empire. Uh, and he comes from uh, managerial petite bourgeois stock, but was a worker himself. Actually, he's interesting because he's a t it's, he's from a time where you actually would meet people who were not formally educated, but would read three or four languages and like devote a whole lot of fucking time to learning about the Soviet Union if they were in a socialist party. Hmm. Um, in other words, he's from like when organic intellectual mean, meant something. Um, there aren't that many. Uh, and even he wasn't from a, like we said, he wasn't from a true working class background. His father was a was a shirt factory manager, uh, and his mother, I believe, ran a candy store. So he's technically the child of uh, labor aristocracy and petite bourgeoisie. Um, and he's kind of also famous for being related to Theodore Draper, who was another. Um, fairly important communist who was an academic. Um, right. So, yeah. Uh, Theodore was educated at Clooney. Um, and how did get a degree from Brooklyn College, which was pretty rare back then. Um, but he was not an academic. And that's he, he only achieved a bachelor's degree. And the reason why I do find it impressive, even though, like, fuck, my grandfather had an eighth grade education from this time period. So, like, and back then that meant something different. Um, but I do find it kind of impressive that, for example, um, he, he taught himself a whole lot by working as a resident librarian in the University of California, Berkeley, and just spending time in the library. Like, so it's interesting how much he, he did have access to like academic uh, materials. And although I have no idea how many Russian party documents and whatnot were translated at the time. And, Sure, you got to imagine that most of his uh, interaction was that was with that was uh, through the like socialist worker party and all of his actual like organizing efforts. But once you get into a library, maybe that explains where he gets some, his grasp on on formal logic, which we start to see pop up yeah. in the middle of this of this. Piece. Yeah, he's uh, he's interesting. He's associated with Max Shackman of somewhat infamy but he's not a shackmanite in fact he kind of bails on that tendency um and joins up with the tendency associated with tony cliff and is even a critic of that um for a variety of reasons uh he was heavily involved in the free speech movement at berkeley but as a worker uh, as like a university worker not as either a student or a professor um and he wrote about it, you know. Uh, he was also the reason why we talk about him in the Tony Cliffites, who I also kind of associate with the 
the Trotskyists that were the largest in America in the 90s and aughts, but also who were the most like incoherent and copacetic to Democrats uh, and have largely liquidated into the DSA. Hmm. Interestingly, when I used to give talks on Draper at the DSA, I've, I did one uh, on Draper and political programs and the, and uh, the meaning of the of uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat and all that. Uh, and I think this was 2017. Um, and it was ISO whites back when the ISO was still a thing, when it was about to you know, fall apart a year later, uh, who went and protested that. So I, I just kind of find it funny. Um, this is a lot of kind of unnecessary uh, preamble, except that you do need to know that he was from the third campus tradition of Trotskyism, because that's actually important to this essay. Yeah. Um, and explaining what that is about, because divisions in Trotskyism are notoriously complicated, um, is that the third campus wing, later on when they join up with the, so, with the international socialist movement, get associated with state capitalists. But at this point, they are bureaucratic collectivist as opposed to either state capitalist or the Foreign Workers Party critiques of the Soviet Union. So okay. what are, um, and if you don't understand that, there's some things about this essay that don't make sense. Right. Um, so well, actually, let's get into the essay because I can explain it more in the context of the essay. So sure. that comes up right at the beginning, too. The meaning of the formula, the inevitability of socialism, is not a new question, but there has arisen an attempt to give it a new importance with a new emphasis as well as a distorted meaning. And what I find interesting about this in particular, this is in 1947. One of the things that's happened is the Great Depression did not liquidate into the global collapse of capitalism as predicted by both the third periodist Soviet Union and um people from the outside like uh henrik grossman and the early early the, like pre what we call first generation frankfurt school i don't actually think of them as the first generation they're really the second okay um, but what it when people refer to first generation frankfurt school i was refer to adorno and horkheimer even though there's an entire generation of scholars before them i didn't know that that's interesting that already like partially answers one of my first questions of why is this written when it is in 1947 when he's talking right. about you know new attempts new importance differentiating from the past but then i guess my follow-up question just to interject really fast would be why does it get republished in 1963 that's a actually good question. And I think it gets republished in 1963 because in the anti-revisionist debates in the 60s, it gets rehabilitated. Hmm, so okay. in debates um, about whether or not one is on the Chinese or Soviet side of the Sino-Soviet split that is beginning to happen, um, how one relates towards Khrushchev, okay. uh, and then later on Brezhnev, um, what these are active debates in the new left and in the American scene, there is a tendency to over-focus on Trotskyist uh, historiography because it's kind of useful for the cold war to be okay. completely frank. But this is also in the time period where the Soviet union itself is critiquing Stalin. Now that's, that's in 63 that is not when this was originally written. Stalin is still the head of the Soviet Union until 1951, when he dies. Um, so, and actually, what is also interesting about this, at this point in time, this is the high point hmm. of the Communist Party USA. So the Communist Party USA had lost a turn of members with the Molotov of Ribbentrop Pact. So a lot of people left. Uh, with that, and then there was also all the expulsions of Trotskyites and Johnstoneites, who were the kind of right opposition in America, like Buc uh, Buc Bucharinist, etc. Okay, um, and that makes the party really small. But during the the Popular Front period, and when FDR slash Truman seems so ascendant, 
um, the Communist Party is seen as normalized. Mm -hmm. And um, it reaches its high point of 75,000 members the year this was written. Wow. So, so it is not just that Draper is from a minority tendency within Trotskyism, that Trotskyism itself is a pretty minority tendency in American communism and socialism. Um, but what's interesting is he's actually predicting debates that are going to stay relevant all the way through the 1970s. Um, because in 1947, the Soviet Union is predicting another imminent depression because the war is over and its ability to starve off the overproduction of capitalism is supposed to kick in and, you know, Keynesianism is not supposed to hold it off. Well, that doesn't really happen until the 1970s in deindustrialization. And even then it doesn't end up at, at the level of depression that was predicted Interesting. by the Soviet Union. Okay. Um, that's what all this inevitability is about because everyone thinks the business cycle is going to come back and look like it did before the war. Um, but that's really funny because what actually happens in the United States is the is the period where you get all these monopoly capital theories and all this start to pop up because that depression doesn't happen. And it looks like they figure out a way to not have a business cycle through Keynesian like social spending policies and, okay. And Fordist production policies and public-private partnerships popping up everywhere, both in the social democratic and non-social democratic world. And so there's just there's this period of like talking about monopoly capital that hasn't happened yet, but okay. this is going into that, and that ends around 1963, 64. That's when that start you start to see that slipping, okay. and this is why it will become relevant again. Interesting. Um, Good so concept. Draper's an interesting figure because he's not part of the new left, but he's because of his relationship to Berkeley, even though he's a fairly like he's not young by that point. Right. Um, uh, he's seen as sympathetic to the to the free speech movement and the SDS. Uh, interestingly enough, formal Trotskyism wasn't super involved in that. Uh, a lot of other CPUSA splits were, and those CPUSA splits tended to be Maoist or Hojist or something weird. Okay. Um, so, whole lot of context. Yes. We haven't even got into the, <laughs> the first paragraph. So, let's read the first yeah. couple paragraphs. Sure. The meaning of the formula, inevitably, of socialism is not a new question. Uh, it ha But there has arisen an attempt to give it a new importance and a new emphasis as well as a distorted meaning. Now, what's interesting about that is Marx himself, and we didn't know this at the time this was written, Marx himself kind of equivocates in his private and, you know, and political writings about the inevitability of socialism versus kind of other things that could happen. For example, if you read Capitals Volume 1 through 3, I actually don't think you see an argument for an inevitably for an inevitability of socialism actually articulated in that text. I haven't come up against one and I'm just finishing capital one. So right. I was wondering really where this starts to appear. Okay. There is some tying it to the tendency of the rate of profit, the fall, which comes up in capital volume two, really. Um, and the theory there is more investment will be put into machines that will uh, reduce socially necessary labor time, but in doing so will also reduce the amount of labor and thus labor value because there's a very kind of direct theory of what labor theory value is in this time period. Okay. Well, that certainly has basis in, in Capital One, but he doesn't elucidate it in that way. Yeah. Okay. It, well, he doesn't. And the argument, the argument you hope people like Michael Heinrich actually raise, for example, is that even if you think Marx does make that argument that he doesn't make that argument very well in, in, in capital volume two. Um, and if there is an empirical tendency of the rate of profit, the fall, that may be the case, but we don't have evidence that it works the way it's explained in capital volume two. Okay. That there's a one-to-one -one relationship into automation and, and, and uh, labor saving machinery that leads to it. And remember that like automation for us means something different than it did for them, even in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, 
because the automation back then is just mechanical. It's Absolutely. not just it's a not new machine, machine does a little bit more. Right. Right. All right. Um, the dust, which was being kicked off on the subject, comes to first place in the direction of J.R. Johnson, formerly of the Workers' Party, and also of the theoreticians of the Canaanite Socialist Workers' Party. So that's the Canaanites are the American branch of official Trotskyism. Okay, good to know. Next question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Answered. Um, like, so just to explain where some people come from and for people who want to know their, their, uh, their, you know, their sectarian left minutia. Um, I'll go. Draper entered the Young People's Socialist League, the YPSL, um, mm -hmm. very early on. Um, As a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was a youth affiliate of the Socialist Party of America. Um, he became a leader of the National Student Movement. Um, his brother joined the CPUSA in the 1930s, which is actually a little bit late because the 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 Socialist Party of America really collapses like in the late teens, early 20s. Huh. Victor Berger and his wife like actually end up like kind of being between the two. Um, what what happens is a one two punch there. Um, Debs ends up in prison because Wilson imprisons him and even uh, also seemingly pretty cynically because the socialists at that point in 1917 uh, or 1916 really have a big portion of the vote. It looks like there's a real outsider chance because they're also aligned with like the, the, the parts of the populist party that didn't go into the Democrats with William James Bryant. And they're a pretty big movement. I mean, Debs commands like 17% of the vote. Wow. Like, it's a, it's, it's a huge thing. Um, Debs ends up in prison for opposing the war. Uh, because the United, even though we can talk all kinds of shit about the Socialist Party of America, they actually voted the way, like, Lenin wanted people to vote in World War I. They were mm -hmm. one of the few left-wing opponents of the war. Whereas, like, I don't know, the S. Pay Day voted for war bonds, which puts them directly into the war and actually means the Bolsheviks to bring you in the Mensheviks, etc. Gotcha. Um, okay. uh, in the 1930s, the, the, the SPA is not that large of a party anymore, and the, the communists are much larger. Um, hmm. They're both really big compared to like what we think of uh, left-wing movements today, like when you adjust for population size. Sure. But they're, you know, they're they're both in the tens of thousands of members. Uh, but the communists are larger. Uh, they have official Soviet support. They have relations with the Comintern um, until the Comintern ends in the mid '30s, and so there you go. Interesting. Uh, the Trotskyists uh, become a tendency in the mid '30s. All right. They're not really kicked out um, until they renounce the Third International in favor of a new Fourth International uh, with Trotsky in 1937. Um, the the YWPSL was thus expelled by the by the Socialist Party and blocked from joining the Communist Party. Although the Canaanites split from the Communist Party. Okay. Okay. Right. All right. Well, let's get back to the text. Yeah. So that's Canada. all your 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 intersection uh, your inter your intersectarian Iana. It um, makes so much more sense in context, <laughs> frankly. Right. Well, people recite this stuff and don't tell you what it's about. Right. Here you go. Um, associated with the position on which we differ from Trotsky's last Delta views, and it's interesting. At this point they are admitting that they don't believe the same thing as Trotsky. There are later people who will try to impugn this on Trotsky himself, and that's really hard to do. Right. His last held views. Right. Okay. His last held views was that Stalinism was the deformed workers' party that had descended into a kind of uh, Soviet Bonapartism. Um, and there was beginning to be a critique coming out of like Ruta Donitskaya and some of the people um, like the Italian left communist, et cetera, 
who criticized the Soviet Union for being capitalist, uh, mm -hmm. both in joining with the capitalist world to fight fascism through the Popular Front and with maintaining market relations from the from the Nash, from the new economic policy with Lenin, um, all the way through the nineteen. 40s which is kind of weird because one of the things that S stalin does is he implements trotsky's agricultural collective policy but like way more brutal than trotsky wanted it <laughs> okay. um but but like trotsky like trotsky actually wanted uh agricultural um collectivization and dekulagization um and it was uh, uh bakarin who really fought against that who thought you had to like keep the peasants aligned with the with the proletariat to develop capacity to run through a period of state capitalism and quickly move that into socialism okay um so there there's all that um so Associated with this position on which we differ from Trotsky's last hell views is our use of the warning socialism or barbarism. These are the alternatives before humanity in our epoch. Yeah. In the use of which we are one with Trotsky. So socialism or barbarism, that phrase comes from Trotsky. Mm. Um, but they don't think that they think it means something different and they're meaning it means something different than what Trotsky meant by it. Right. And also Trotsky's not that long dead at this point. Like Trotsky oh, died. Sure. Like, I mean, uh, Trotsky dies, I believe, in the late 20s. Um, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. um, when does Trotsky die? I should know this. I've literally been to his fucking house in Mexico City. He dies in 1940. Excuse me. Oh, okay. So he's only been dead seven years by the time this is written. Um, and one of the things that that always puts the the third campus in weird situation is how Draper is the one who doesn't become associated with either the socialist right. Max Shackman becomes associated with Michael Harrington and what would become the DSA eventually. Okay. And um, Max Shackman also his students uh, become associated with, with some people who get linked to neoconservatism in the 1970s and eighties. Um, the crystals. Specifically. Interesting. Okay, I was aware of the Trotskyist uh, crossover, but not right. specifically the names. Right. Well, the thing is, it's also overstated because a lot of neoconservatives were also 60s Maoists, like David Horowitz was a Maoist, but no one ever okay. talks about that. They only talk mm -hmm. about the Trotskyists because the Trotskyists are easier to pick on. Yeah. Um, all right. The combination of the two, however, apparently arouses in the aforementioned comrades a violent reaction. This takes the form of heatedly denouncing as un-Marxist any suggestion that capitalism... This is so funny because no one debates this now, not even Marxist-Leninists. No. Um, possibly can be possibly followed by a society other than socialism. Crystallization in the mechanical formulation of inevitability and accuses us of abandoning Marxism and posing the existence of alternative uh, of historical alternatives. And I, I point this out because a lot of people do not want to deal with the fact that prior to the 1960s, and again, see, this is why this was reprinted. Um, it was thought that not only was socialism, the resolution of the problem of communism, but it was inevitable, right? That there was no other way for history to go. Now, Marx's own writings are highly ambivalent on this, particularly his later writings, and that may be something to deal with. But, like, this is the beginning of the whole stage theory debate. Gotcha. Interesting. So a question that came up to my mind when I was reading through this part is, like, if this debate isn't really being had now, but we do talk about what stage of capitalism we're in, whether it's late stage or we talk about neoliberalism and, you know, public-private interactions... So Late or even if you wanted to talk about like you know techno neo feudalism, like right. would that Ugh. be unmarxist? Yeah. Well, at this point, yes. Mm -hmm. um, late stage capitalism does come from a Marxian, not a Marxist economist. Okay. Called Werner Sombart. He's the one who he not only coins the word late capitalism, he also coins the word capitalism. You will notice if you actually read the German, it's not in capital. They don't refer to capitalism. Sombart, you said? Yeah, Werner Sombart. The reason okay. why I don't talk about Sombart anymore 
is Sombart's associated with the right wing of the SP Day mm. uh, and with Max Weber in the historical school of German economists, which is why I've been doing, um, and it will have come out by the time this is released, mm. a series on the German historical school. But Sombart goes from, this is his trajectory. He's a Marxist. He's praised by Engels himself during wow. his life. All right. Then he gets associated with the historical school, which was kind of a neo-Kantian stage, like also considered German or conservative socialist. Hmm. Uh, they believe in the neutrality of the state. They believe in the state as final arbiter. They believe in like the state and current emergent economy. They believe that socialism needs to be national, not international. Hmm. Um, and that national characters are developed in specific conjunctions. Uh, Sombart is associated with that. Then by the end of his life, he's a Nazi. So right. even though he's super important to like, when we start talking about late capital, which is really mm. kind of associated with Trotskyist Ernst Mandel, but was actually coined by Sombart. Okay. Um, anyway, so, so that idea already exists, but it's not considered a Marxist idea yet. It's not like reintegrated back into Marxism because Sombart's a traitor. Yeah, like, fair enough. Abandon that. Right. Although Sombart becomes important in the 70s because he writes a book in 1905 called Why Americans Aren't Socialist, which is republished in 1973 and like used by the new left to explain why they failed. Interesting. So, you know, all this stuff intersects. But anyway, we begin. This is an inter-Trotskyist fight, though, and it's important to know. But it's also Trotsky himself was critiqued. Because the socialism or barbarism framework is considered like, well, you know, official stage theory from the Soviet Union argues that that's not possible. There's no mm. way it has to go into socialism. There's no way for stuff to fail. I don't think Lenin actually thought that way either, even though he thought there were like stages of development. Because if you take that super seriously, then the idea of socialism in one country is also something that doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. So... Anyway, when the fonts of the theoretical ignorance are exhausted along these lines, there are not infrequently follows the slanderous insinuation that the Workers' Party predicts or expects the worldwide coming to power of bureaucratic collectivism, which naturally entails an, an abandonment of the socialist perspective and any reason for continuing socialist struggle. And this is not helped by the fact that the... that one of the people associated with this faction in its early points is James Burnham, who defects in 1940 from Trotskyism altogether and from Marxism altogether mm -hmm. and writes the managerial revolution. And that's where the kind of right wing theory of bureaucratic collectivism, managerialism emerges. Interesting. And he does think that it's becoming the worldwide government and that it's going to solve the the problems of capital and that's the basis on which monopoly capital theories get re re picked up in the 50s okay got to talk for half an hour and we covered all of five paragraphs so let me finish <laughs> this first section and i said we we probably do this in uh two recordings and i was obviously dear listener and jordan full of shit um, it's going to be a couple more than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to finish this and I'll let you ask any questions that come to mind. Sure. Uh, we begin where the Canon Johnson view tries to grapple with the subject in a really deep quotation and scholarly quotation fashion. That's, you can feel the snark coming off of that. Yeah. It is in any case necessary to start this far back. A Johnson disciple, Dixon Woods and a currently circulated piece on the subject, offers as a springboard when he states that he believes to the heart of the scientific question as follows. If one poses, poses two or more possible lines of future historical development and sees the equal possibility of realization of any one of them, he is claiming, in effect, that history is a matter of chance. We have to analyze, A, the Marxist kernel of thought which this writer had in mind in framing the sentence, and B, the way he managed to convert Marxist thought into nonsense. <laughs> Um, Straight out with it. Just tell us how you really feel. So, how? I mean, what, for those of you who got tired of the sectarianism, 
Um, most of our discussions of this won't revolve around this, but it is important to know that this is coming in a particular context. And this is the context of the pre-New Left Marxism, because I think this essay is actually, it strikes you as like, wait, people thought that like Marxist, even like Marxist, Leninist and all this would be like, people thought that socialism was immediately inevitable. And the answer is yes, they yeah. did. Like, um, and you know, I, I hate to say it, but now it looks like, like, uh, the Hal Draperites of the world are vindicated on at least this issue. Um, b- because not only do you not have worldwide communism by now, you also have the fact that the Soviet Union fell apart. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so what what is your takeaway about this? Like, how do you respond to to this sort of framing? Because I, I don't. One thing I want people to understand is this was a communist intellectual, a socialist intellectual debate. Um, it did play down in common people's rhetoric, but I don't think the average rank and file communist, our socialist, or even Trotskyist thought in these rarefied terms, except in so much they saw it as a debate within key figures in their movement in the party newspapers. Hmm. Um, And newspaper culture was highly important to both the Communist Party USA and to the Trotskyist movements and split. Interesting. The the piece that he says uh, this is currently uh, circulating in, is that like a different newspaper than the one that this would be published in? Uh, We're Dixon in the Wins. New yes. International, yeah. It would be in the SWP's paper. Um, okay. So so I guess I do have to go more into sectarian, yeah, because by 1947 is when Trotsky's parties really start to split. Um, so I'm actually going to dip into my flow chart. Of Gotta Trotskyist parties. Chart. Oh my God! I'm so glad that uh, Amal uh, Sanaha um, actually put this thing together because I've been trying to find a good explanation of all, all these, these 10 to 15 years, and, and from Achilles' point of view. Um, so at this. Um, the canon faction in the CPUSA uh, exist only for about a year in 1928. Um, the Communist League of America exists from 1928 to 1934, and it's a Trotsky's okay. faction. Uh, it includes a bunch of key people, like I've already mentioned, Max Shannon and uh, mm. Max Shackman and James Cannon. Then it splits off. And the American Workers' Party, which is a um, socialist faction of the AFL, so not the union that we normally associate with radicalism. We normally associate the CIO with radicalism. Right. But the AFL actually tried to form a Workers' Party in 1933, 1934. They join with the Communist League of America together and become the Workers' Party of the United States. And that produces a whole people who are kind of still well known: uh, James Cannon, Max Shackman, A.J. Musty, James Burnham, who I mentioned, you know, the great traitor of Trotskyism, uh, Martin Abern, um, Hugo Orwheeler, and Albert Goldman. A lot of these people were more well known uh, in earlier time periods, but at that point. There's a revolutionary worker section that splits off with uh, Hugo Euler, and they become a kind of militant workers' party that can see the workers' party to aggressive. Uh, then there's also a split that starts with the Spartan League. Uh, which are split up of the of the aforementioned Young People's Socialist League, which is the young people part of the Socialist Party of America, which okay. I talked about. Okay. Um, they, 
they end up this point we have the formation of the Socialist Workers Party of the Furf International International. Right. See, okay. um, the third international international has been just at this point. Uh, um, however, there are tendencies to start a motoring in the 50s. And so you have C faction, which becomes the American, the Fourth International. You have Artists' supporters, which become the Spartacist League, or like Orthodox Communist beginnings of uh, other tendencies and breakoffs in Britain, because where Trotskyists are important historically is actually in the United States and uh, like the British left is overwhelmingly Trotskyists as they're not in the Britain. Because they're not what? I didn't catch the Okay, last part. so all this shit. What, what are they fighting over? Yeah. The, because they're not part of the Communist Party of Great Britain, which is officially, which is a party that's actually big but and is officially aligned to the common turn doesn't function within labor and the Trotskyists work with the labor party a lot okay. more. Huh. So the Trotskyists of the 1960s end up being more important in Britain specifically. So a lot of the key, like we're writing over like the different heads that exist now, mm -hmm. like we talk about Cliff Ice and Grantites, these are divisions over these questions within British Trotskyism that come to America later. Are merged groups later. Okay. Um, the American splits are basically the Spartacist League, which are the Orthodox Trots. They hold up the deformed worker state thesis. The third campus sections, which is initially Alachmanites, um, which um, I believe originally become the the militant. I'm actually making, they really start splitting um, in the 1940s. And then 1960s, this goes fucking crazy. Both the Maoists and the Trots start splitting like crazy. Um, okay. So that's when things like, so interestingly in the time period where this is republished is another time period where these parties are splitting all over the place. Now the U S uh, the U S S W P still technically exists. It's ran by like very all old throughout. people. It's here because it's trying. Uh, no, after Cannon dies, it's ran okay. by like very, very old people. So in the 1970s, it takes a weird stance against the Soviet in a kind of but ending Cuba. So yeah. Interesting. The, and the, that's when did, things get did really, you mention the like, the independent socialist so, league that I saw he was a part of like towards the end and then broke off from that and created the independent socialist club. Which well, that's also in the, left that's like way guy. yeah that's in the that's, that's actually much later. In the, yeah that's that's in the 70s. So that's when the oh, when he okay. leaves that is when he writes the famous essay Anatomy of a Microsect, which is super famous in in Marxism for defining like f f so even the the Trotskyist movements, we're still talking about thousands of people in these movements. Yeah. Right. Um the Teamsters start off as a Trotskyist union, for example. Like this is huh. not a small movement, it's small compared to the communist movement. And in the communist movement, we're dealing with tens of thousands of people. By the time we get into the 1970s, most of these sects, including the Communist Party itself, are around 5,000 or less people. Now, the SDS is huge, but it's actually quite like the DSA in that like, it's a clearinghouse of different sects. And not all of them are even socialists. Like, there's all kinds of groups in that. Um, eventually, like the RCP takes over like part of the leadership, their Maoist split from the CPUSA. Uh, that's the first major Maoist group. What you'll also find funny 
if you really read this, is the parties we associate with anti-revisionism today, the world, wor the Workers' World Party and the PSL, the Party for Socialism and Immigration, uh, are actually parties that abandon Trotskyism and the aughts. Hmm. That, you know, that, so I find that pretty hilarious. It is kind of funny. And also, we have to remember that the Trotskyists, the third campus do not defend the Soviet Union the other groups defend the Soviet Union because they think the workers could take it back. Huh. That was something right, so that wasn't entirely clear the, the workers to me. Could... Right. Yeah. So the forum work theoretically think that over the formed worker state in its Bonapartist things. So it leads to this weird situation where in communist groups they're fighting Stalinists, but in and it gets really complicated with Maoists come on board because the Maoists are against the Soviets, but they're pro-Stalinist, but they're not really. So, like, depending on which kind of Maoist you're talking about, um, yeah, because Maoism has a Maoism actually has a critique of Stalin, but they keep it on the down low because they're actually hmm. fighting the Soviet Union for not being Stalinist enough. It's real fucking funny, but. Um, at this time period, um, there's just, there's so many splits. Now, what I find interesting is like, basically Draper kind of feels like there's a tendency towards sectarian, where he thinks that basically what communists should do is what communists did from like, by the time that the time period you're talking about, he thinks that communists should, should, uh, work for like communist magazines like monthly review interestingly draper's associated huh. with the founding of monthly review i believe oh, um okay. you double check that um so do, 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 do. um nope that's a revolutionary workers league that's a different group uh let me make sure i have this history down right um draper um, yeah, Draper's associated with a monthly review. That's why the monthly review is his five fucking volume. And I think until the the German scholarship going on right now on Marx's life and the new Marx lecture and the MAGA two, uh, sure. his his Karl Marx's theory of revolution, which was which was started to be published uh, in 1977 and was published up until his death in 1990 is the best scholarship on the relationship between Marx's writing and Marx's life. Um, which is really interesting to me. Uh, so Draper, Draper becomes associated with the monthly review after he kind of gives up on um, the international socialist and the independent socialist league, which he, thinks on our, our sect and he thinks that the best that socialists can do is go back into studying their history and what was actually believed by socialists and why they believed it. So he um, cares very deeply about like the slanderous charges of revisionism and things being on Marxist. Right. Yeah, he does. He actually, and cause he's one of the first people who goes like, look, he's not one of the people who goes, Hey, look, Ingalls fuck this up. That's, that's other people in the new left. Mm. But he is of the group that goes, look, like a lot of what we are talking about now has been distorted by politics between states who have claimed to represent Marxism. And not just in that are we talking about the Soviet Union and China. We're also talking about, you know, a lot of newly freed states. We're also talking about social democratic states in Norway, which claim mm -hmm. a heritage. We're talking about the SP Day. Like he's like all of these people had politics that was making concessions to reality that they were going back and trying to justify by changing what people said. And even if knowing what people said doesn't give you the answer, um, it is important that we understand what they actually believe. So Draper is most famous in addition to that. He's most famous for anatomy of a microsect, which everybody uses, even if they're not, like Trotsky is sympathetic. Hmm. Um, he's kind of famous for Karl Marx's theory of revolution, the five volume set. 
which I think is super important. He's also uh, big on the socialism from below, like empowering the workers, not quite workers cancel, but close sort of tendency, which he introduced in the pamphlet, Two Tolls of Socialism. Although there was this idea of the united front from below, which actually comes from the Stalinist period when they're opposed to the popular front, the, it's complicated. So he's not, he doesn't totally come up with it. Um, and then he becomes an editor of this big thing, which was called the Marx Engels Cyclopedia, which was an attempt to like get all the writings that they could find in English and like put them together just to figure out, Hey, what the fuck did definitionally they even, right? yeah, what they mean? Because we know that so much of the stuff was suppressed by both the S pay day. And then later by the Soviets, like uh, we know, for example, the MAGA one major theorist, Ranziski was, was executed by Stalin and the purges. Um, you know, we know a whole lot of that stuff. So he gets associated with that, but unlike most of the new left, yeah, he's associated with Berkeley. Yeah, he works at a college, but he's not an academic. He's not a scholar. And what you can't throw at him that you can throw at a lot of other people is him being linked to like the CIA or any of that. Uh -huh. um, so, um, and, and actually he's considered both a precursor to the new left, but also a critic of it. So, like, because he thinks the new left unleashes all the sectarian tendencies and opportunism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what's interesting about him is that uh, the Workers' Party, the kind of new Workers' Party the, the, in the faction led by Shackman, Burnham, and Aburn, and, and uh, you can't, he, Draper's not associated with becoming a right winger. Right. Uh, either a right-wing socialist like Shackman, who had people who became neoconservatives, or like Burnham. Burnham's kind of a key figure in both the neoconservative and paleoconservative movement. He's like the great traitor. That's so uh, weird. So just even by distancing self, himself and like dissociating with, with sects as he mm -hmm. goes throughout his life, he still clings to what he describes here as scientific Marxism. He, like he'll talk about the political elements, but he's not trying to get into like philosophical questions. He's mm -hmm. really trying to stay true to the original text uh, to the point that apparently providing an encyclopedia of definitions. And uh, apparent, I mean, that must be something that, that makes him relevant till today. Well, what's interesting about him is like, he really doesn't believe that Marxism is just a political philosophy. He thinks this is like a scientific approach, but he doesn't take the kind of dogmatic lockstep that was common in both the Trotskyist and the Marxist Leninist movement. Well, that right. Things were going to go their way. And basically what's interesting, what's also interesting about him is everybody else kind of has to have a betrayal moment. Even the Stalinists have like, well, <laughs> you know, we're betrayed with Khrushchev or we're betrayed by the sino Soviet split. And the bureaucratic collectivists go, well, no, this is actually an emergent tendency of the fact that this revolution didn't happen to, to connect up with the periphery. Right. It was going to have to be Bonapartist. It needed capitalist like collective organization to develop, but it got stuck there. That's, that's their explanation. Hmm. Like, and until 1992, and I, we don't really know what Draper would have done after 1992. Draper dies in 1990. Um, the Trotsky is still like, all the questions about like whether or not this is bureaucratic collectivism or state capitalism or are state capitalism bureaucratic collectivism the same thing or, or is it the form worker state and again i actually think you could believe all three of those things to, like like because i pointed out to people that the form worker states about the nature and the class character of the state hmm. Uh, state capitalism is about the way the state interacts with capital development. Sure. And uh, bureaucratic collectivism is about like the nature of who's running that state. Um, and you could hmm. no Trotskyist did this, but a Trotskyist could actually say all three of those theories are right. Like what is interesting about 1992, and this is actually in a book called Revolutionary Strategies by uh, 
Mike McNair, which I have back here, uh, which I don't agree with a lot of things. A lot of the DSA's current iteration doesn't so much come from Michael Harrington, but a kind of right socialist. And by right socialist, I don't mean stress or right or any of that. I mean mm. like, I mean like uh, market socialist friendly. Um, gotcha. Okay. Uh, reading of that text, but what what uh. What um, Mike Manair points out is like all of the socialists predicted something um, in regards to what was going to happen with the development of the Soviet Union. And the Trotskyists all had the most developed theories and all of them had predictions that were associated with them about how the Soviet Union was going to end. And none of them predicted it right, although certain Trotskyist sects have interpreted 1992 in ways that make it that realign it with predictions. But basically they basically all of them basically think the workers are going to take over. Um, and that, or that there's going to be like the Soviet union is not going to make any sense. There becomes some Trotskyist around this guy named Hillel Tickton, who comes up with a fourth answer to this, which is the non mode of production, which is like the, the situation of the Soviet Union, particularly after 1947, is so complicated that it doesn't actually fit any of the theories. Oh, God. And therefore, it's incoherent um, and was a non-viable form. I am sometimes persuaded by that, but then I'm also sometimes like, well, but by that definition, like, feudalism is incoherent. It existed for, like, a thousand fucking years. Sure. So, like... I mean, well, isn't kind of a the point if we're going to just like essentialize to the marks that's easy enough to grasp from inevitability that like capitalism has so many inherent contradictions that and it's too complicated to last well, as well well basically yes but but by 1947 there's really only a theory of there's two kinds of capitalism there's pre-industrial agrarian capitalism mm. of the italian city states and like the early bourgeois revolutions in England, yes. and there's post-industrial capitalism that Marx is beginning to write about that's spreading through Europe, or okay. industrial capitalism, really. Like, by the time you start getting to Keynesianism and fascism, uh, Schachtism, uh, chartalism, state mm -hmm. theories of money, um, these other forms of capitalism, uh, and it's like... A market market socialism with Keynesian characteristics runs out in 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 Europe. Um, Euro communism is like a critique of that, but it's one that also basically accepts its premises. Okay. Um, in America, Fordism develops, and that leads to a whole lot of monopoly capital theories. And a lot of people rightly notice that, like, well, the planners of society and the things predicted by Bukharin all the way back in his book on imperialism, and I think the late 19-teens, early 1920s. I have to actually look at when that book is published. Mm -hmm. um, he Like, Bukharin notices, and that's what th that's why imperialism is supposed to be the highest stage of capitalism. So that's, that is, like, Lenin summarizing and simplifying Bukharin's argument that, hey, these capitalist states are getting more and more um, propping up this really complicated system, more than just, like, taking land from peasants and, and forcing people in the markets. They're sure. literally... An integral part of the management of capitalism and they're a prime buyer and stakeholder in a way that they weren't in the 19th century. Um, although they kind of were in the 18th century and I don't know why Marxists don't deal with that. But but whatever. Mm -hmm. Neither here nor there. Um, that That's really where you start getting this idea of multiple stages of capitalism. So you get imperialism the highest stage of capitalism you get warner sumbart about 10 years before that who argues um that we were in late capitalism because of industrial development where there's going to be depressions all the time um so you're getting this idea of periods of capitalism emerging in marxism but they kind of think that like 1914 style imperialism is going to be the end of it that there won't be any other way to restore profitability because it's, you know, everyone's going to try to carve the world up into different markets right. and it's going to really cause everything to collapse. Um, they don't see anything like the Britain Woods Keynesian Fordist agreement emerging. And they're just constantly blindsided by where that goes. Yeah. 
Um, and then they also don't see it ending except for Ernst Mandel and his version of late capitalism, which is about the collapse of Fordism. Um, but we've been predict. I mean, one of the things that everyone's noticed is we've been predicting that this phase of capitalism is going to be the last one for forever. And that's why I started doing this uh, Eugenie Morozov paper with uh, with uh, the the no royal road oh, right. oh, gotcha. people hmm. because we're actually we're we did a whole we're going to do a whole lot on like different theories of feudalism and and whatnot but we also like to point out what people are predicting like neo-feudalism like well how does that not make sense like how is this actually how is the how is this supposedly the end of the mcm circuit like because we've heard this before sure right um and almost inevitably, it doesn't go that way. Like, rentiers don't actually take over. Production ends up still being the most important sector of the economy, etc. Like, yes, services are super important because of, honestly, the reduction of socially necessary labor time. But um, you laugh because a lot of socialists don't even believe this anymore. Like... Yeah. We've been seeing and hearing that recently, especially. <laughs> yeah, I know. In uh, our own circles. <laughs> yeah. So this is an hour, and I said it was going to be a half an hour. So, Jordan, I'd like to thank you for coming. Do you have any other questions? I know I've been mansplaining things to you. No, it's um, good. Honestly, like, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to put this in the context that we did before we go on. Because next we have to talk about, like, you know, determinism and causality and then relate back to this initial statement about inevitability and chance. Where does that fall in? Right. And, uh, I find it interesting because this actually predicts some of the scientific arguments that are going to be really contentious and like the French new left that's about so contingency and determination. Right. I um, had to keep reminding like, myself I'm reading something from 1947. Yeah. Well, this is from 47. This is not like, like we don't have like, at this point, for example, you could still be forgiven for not believing in general relativity. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, and stuff like that. Like, like, I think we have to remind ourselves of that, which means, and, and like, yeah, like I, I have pointed out that I want people to understand Draper was formally educated, got a bachelor's degree from Cooney, um, but he was not a fucking professor. That was his brother. Right. Right. Like his brother was part of the communist professors that the Birchers were always talking about. Um, this dude was like a working class guy who became a, a Berkeley librarian. And, and he was just steeped in theory and starting to apply some reason to all of the sectarian infighting that was coming up right around he, this major question. Like he basically like I he has a bachelor's degree understanding of science. Um, and it's just going off of that and being like, look, I know enough science to know when you're talking shit. Yeah. Um, and I know hey, enough he logic and water philosophy. Out of. That's good for me. What? Yeah, he knows what water is composed of and that it's not going to get you a highball if you put hydrogen and oxygen together <laughs> in a test tube. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fascinating. We do definitely have a lot to cover here, obviously. But, you know, yep. sometimes but I think someone to explain the, the Trotskyist you know, tree of life to you <laughs> first. Well, I also think it's important to understand like what these were, debates were about and why, like why it mattered, because I think the, the, both the Soviet and the, you know, and the Trotskyist position is really hard to remember that like, no, since like the, since like the second international, everyone's been arguing that socialism is inevitable. That's right. That it will happen. That there is nothing else that can happen. Um, I mean, you have Trotsky that will, once we get to that, like talking about like, okay, it's it's all well and good, inevitability. But like, also, what if the other side wins? Can <laughs> right. we ask that question too? Without right. getting into fatalism? And like, if I can't think of anything more relevant till today, especially people who are kind of dipping their toes in and learning now. Like yeah. I am, to some like degree. accelerationism, and because accelerationism is like a weird backwards version of immiserationism, and immiserationism was this idea that there was a one-to-one -one correlation between um, 
how bad the working class have it and how revolution was going to immediately happen, which makes some of Marx's positions politically hard to explain. Yeah. Because Marx, for example, argued that we shouldn't argue for like, you know, full employment because capitalists will never allow that. That's that would collapse the system. But any anything that we can get that can make workers life better that we can actually get, we should get. Yeah, like and particularly not pretend to get it and then hope it fails or radicalize the public. He might Mark specifically thought that that was like the dumbest strategy you could immerse. That's, that's what that that's what that quote, I am not a Marxist, is actually about. Like now I understand talking okay. to the French Marxist who are have a program that they're offering uh, and he's talking to his his son-in-law actually and saying, like, look, if you think you can promise the workers these reforms and then you botch it and you think that that's going to make them radical and overthrow the capitalist order that's fucking stupid nothing like, can sound more idealist you. in just even like classical terms you know if like you're not actually going to deliver on material conditions but you're just talking about how good things could be in order to you know pull the wool over their eyes that doesn't sound very but very almost our marxists were developmentalists and that's also something to remember like they thought that capitalism was necessary mm -hmm. and that there was sometimes weird split offs like asiatic despotism are uh later on might be called by samir amin and co like tributary modes of production that don't follow the same pattern and later on at the end of marxist life you have this weird compromise position that he has where he says, like, look, the Russian communes could actually probably skip capitalism, but only because capitalism has existed in Europe. And they can, like, piggyback on that and Figure use their them. communal forms, but they can get the technology if they can find someone in the in the, some socialist from the capitalist world to help them develop it. Sure. And Plakhanov and uh, Lenin, who don't seem to know about those letters hmm. to Vera Zurich, um, actually, in a debate that was from that was from a different debate in Russia itself where there's a person arguing like, well, the Russian communes are already fucking communist. We can just do them. And Plakhanov goes, no, we need to develop capitalism first um, because it'll, if we try. So there's part of, yeah, there's part of that. I think is brilliant. And part of that, I think it's horribly stupid. <laughs> so, so like the socialists end up being big pushers uh, under Plakhanov and the Mensheviks and also in the, in the Germany too of like, pushing capitalism even suppressing workers to develop monopoly capital so they can take it over by state um whereas and i think that's dumb but one yeah. of the things that Plakhanov is afraid of is socialists trying to force development through dictatorial um capitalist practices super fast and it being a disaster and turning people against socialism and that unfortunately looks to have kind of panned out that's funny so Fuck. so like i think in one sense Plakhanov's political instincts are idiotic but his fear about what trying to do state capitalism transition and socialism would lead to is a disaster now what i think is interesting now is is that developmentalism sounds like accelerationism except accelerationism is actually taking developmentalism and immiserationism and smashing them together like <laughs> like <laughs> We need everything to get better so it can also get worse. So that, yeah. so that, uh, that sounds like the Muppet Babies version. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, this and, that. and it's not even based in Marx's logic. It's based in Deleuze and Guattari logic. Like for the most part, I mean, there are Marx's variants of accelerationism, but it, you know, it's either that or the people who think are they're like hyper developmentalists like Nick Schrenek who think that like, well, we could like we could get away with we could do away with labor now. Like we have enough automation to do it, um, which I'm like you do if you have stable forms of power. But if you don't have stable forms of power, then you, know, you don't really. And like you still need people to run the machines, dude. They don't run themselves, and if they did, they're kind of people at that point. What do you like? <laughs> like you gotta um, liberate them too, I guess. Oh. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> like, uh, you, like if if. If, if robots become human enough alike to produce value like humans do, they're slaves. Yeah. Like, like you know. Um, but would they enjoy going to the theater and having picnics? That's why we need Mark still. 
Because he um, talks about this stuff. Yeah, Marx plus Isaac Asimov, I guess. Although, <laughs> my, my contention is I actually don't think we understand how cognition works in humans enough for us to like replicate it in robots. So I'm not actually particularly worried. I don't think robot intelligence. Um, my fear, for example, of like a of like chatbot AI, yeah, yeah, is just going to freeze our knowledge and the collective knowledge of humanity before night before 2020, and that's just going to freeze it all. We become super dependent on what we used to be able to do. Jeez because well, we're not contributing to it in any way and there might be it, and there might be some monkeys around a typewriter effect literally by recombinations but it's not going to be it, it it's not going to work the same way so i'm not nearly as accelerationist as everyone else good to know you can always tell me that i'm mansplaining too much you know that no right? no <laughs> now i'm just imagining like chat gbt like actually run by monkeys and then how are we going to organize them it's very confusing i well <laughs> i have friends who tell me that there's some correction in chat gpt that's actually manual people to make sure it doesn't become like the racist chat gpt robots that existed priorly because the problem with chat with chat gpt is it's going to have the ideology of the most of the people inputting the most input into it yes clearly and you know so like and I just trip it up. Every time I use Trap GPT, I'm like, write me the Communist Manifesto as if yeah. by an 18th century poet and Baudrillard. And it just goes, I can't do that. I can't. Aha. Uh -huh. Well. And I'm like, well, I have tricked you again. What? <laughs> <laughs> I think that we need to build one that with like zero input that has anything to do with consciousness and see if it comes upon it itself. Uh, that was what the the organic computing people were trying to do by running programs that actually mimicked um, amino acid based unicellular life. Um, apparently, it's just really fucking slow. You need, I don't know, millions and millions of years or something. To, sure, sure, like, sure. It's to, almost like it needs to evolve or something. Yeah. Well, like, and, and it takes a long time for that to happen. I don't know. Maybe that's why it doesn't <laughs> happen all the time. I just, <laughs> maybe why life seems more rare than it should be. I, I have no <laughs> idea. But the more I learn about science and biology, the less, the less secure I am about like talking about a lot of this shit. Like, that's good. Like, you know, because I'm always like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I, the more, the more I play with math, the less I feel like I know about the universe, um, and the less I'm even sure that math is real, even though I feel like it's super helpful. <laughs> it probably is real. Or, I know, I know, I know. I'm like, I have a lot of plainness in my audience. I love this, though. You touched on that with one of your guests. Not so that I'm not ago. a Platonist, that I'm a, yeah. that I am like a third thing. I don't believe that math is just a language. I think it is analogous to something that, to some kind of abstraction that actually can be deduced from the world. Right. But I don't necessarily think that like the world works like math any more than I think the world looks like any language. Yet I also don't think language is purely fucking arbitrary. And I mean, it is kind of arbitrary, but like, like oh, I am a materialist and I believe that most ideas actually are analogous to things we observe in, in the world. Sure. Um, are there things that help us socially reproduce ourselves? Are we wouldn't believe them in large enough numbers for it to be passed on? And that right. includes well, a lot of things we consider irrational, to. like religion and shit. Like, I actually mm -hmm. do think like religion exists for a reason or it wouldn't exist. Like, like we might move beyond it. Um, I think we are, although sometimes I think we are moving beyond it in a very negative way. Like we're just mm. becoming so, so decommunalized that like the coherence of some kind of arbitrary belief that like a religion doesn't even make sense anymore. But, um, Jesus. Yeah. That's, that's, that's when I get like socialism or barbarism, but maybe like barbarism one already. Like <laughs> jury's out. I'm sure we'll figure it out by, by the by end, the of, end this of this reading. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not even to go back into the socialism, the barbarism debates in France in the 1960s or Celia James. Yeah, barbarism yeah. or barbarism. Are the fun <laughs> stuff like uh, like uh, Bordiga who wrote Avante Barbarai, which is like we must for like we're gonna get through socialism because we need the barbarism to get there. Like. <laughs> 
I want socialism plus a little bit of paganism versus socialism. just like barbarism, barbarism with a with a cross. Yeah, it's with uh, an iron cross. Uh, um, oh man, we're on that note. When we always we ends. always circle around to Nazis eventually. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for the first Jordan guest um, on the How Draper series. Uh, we are at least doing two How Draper essays. One of the essays is book length. Um, wow. So that's going to be fun. And that's this on one's the... only supposed to be 10 pages or so. So, you know. Yeah, it, it it's actually, I actually think the book length one's a little easier because it's not as dense, nor do I have to explain all right. the sectarian breakups of the left in the sure. fucking 1920s to 1950s. Like, no, the, the following sections will be a lot more fluent, I think. Yeah. And they're really they're, interesting. I think they're, I think they're actually interesting on a, I actually do think interestingly, even though they're not a philosophical speculation, I think they're interesting for philosophy of science. A hundred percent. Yes. Awesome. Cool. I'm like, excited. All right. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Where's the button?